why wasn't Ferguson and the shooting of Michael Brown the global, not just the national, but a global catalyst, not only for the movement for Black Lives, but also for these, um, for these, for these protests in ways that the shooting of Breonna Taylor uh, and George Floyd, in particular, though not exclusively, had uh, have uh, have uh, have led because. In many regards, what you all are talking about is not only then become the national reckoning that still needs to happen in uh, the United States context, but also in the case of South Africa, but all around the world, the ways in which um, uh, in our current moment, there has been a global reverberation. So if you could both perhaps comment on why um, uh, I'm particularly thinking of Ferguson, but it could also be why not in recent um, times, uh, was there not the type of response and the types of movements, mass movements that we're we're seeing? Why why now and not necessarily uh, whether it was Ferguson or other critical junctures? I mean, I guess I would say I'm sh if I'll say a few things that I think are at play, um, and it has a lot to do with this very specific context of 2020. Uh, one, the national leadership we have the uh, President Trump. So this has been, the last four years has been, you know, in some ways, a, a escalating series of mobilizations, whether it's the Women's March, whether it's the protests around the Muslim ban. So there's been a kind of crescendoing of popular mobilization and protests more generally, I think. And th I think there is this kind of deep-seated and more wide-ranging frustration at, at the particular uh, political context we find ourselves in now that just wasn't quite there in 2014 um, under under Obama and in in that context there was also a way in which of course uh, the ways that the Obama administration especially the Department of Justice responded very quickly I think made people feel made people who are further away from the movement feel like this is something that's being taken care of the second thing I would say is that you know, I think when the movement for Black Lives started, and when, um, especially, and especially with its kind of es escalation around Ferguson, the kinds of things that movement activists have been talking about for decades now, first entered the public sphe sphere, right? Like a, a deeper critique of the carceral state that goes beyond just reform, but is really thinking about defunding and dismantling police institutions. That was a very new kind of conversation to enter the public sphere in 2014. And I think what you see is that, you know, movement activists and organizers have done the work of, of putting their language and putting their analysis into the public sphere in the intervening years, such that by 2020, you know, you have citizens calling into city councils across the country saying cut the police budget, like I want education, I want healthcare, I don't want this, right? Um, and I think also what has helped to make that possible is what I was saying about the kind of pandemic context, right? I mean, the pandemic context one is is one that has revealed once more the various kinds of slow death that Black people and people of color in the United States are subject to. It's like you don't only die from police violence, right? You die from state neglect, uh, from and and the, and the pandemic has of course disproportionately affected people of color in America. It has also, you know, been a context in which. The, the U.S. has been incapable of providing the most basic forms of economic support, uh, things that other countries, uh, developed countries, have done. So I think there's this deep-seated frustration about, about this lack of adequate state response to the pandemic. And I think it's the conjunction of, you know, uh, lethal state response in the case of George Floyd, who's, who was accused of of using a fake $20 bill, that's what he was killed for. That kind of rapid, lethal state response against this, against the backdrop of persistent state neglect of basic necessities, I think has helped to fuel and galvanize uh, people nationally and globally in a way that, you know, the conditions weren't exactly the same in 2014. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Michael, if you Perhaps yeah. Also add I think, yeah, I think Adome has sort of captured the broad 
political economy, uh, uh, you know, under which Floyd's death happens in the United States. I, I think that in the South African context, I think what you had uh, in a sense was this reawakening that clearly, uh, you know, global justice and issues around racism, uh, you know, continue to be a rallying call for minorities and for that matter, oppressed minorities. I mean, I remember when Floyd's video went viral, I was driving from my office <laughs> and there was the sudden upsurge of protests as I passed, you know, from the office. And I realized that South Africans had also begun to realize that, hey, uh, African-Americans are certainly not on their own in the struggle for racial equality. But what it also did for South Africa was to reawaken, you know, this, in a sense, skewed notion that all of us are equal. Uh, and that, to us, began to demonstrate that the struggle for racial equality, even within the South African context, remains unattained. And therefore, when Floyd died, um, there was this sort of understanding that, you know, that racism, even in the United States, continues to be a policy that uh, that country, the U.S., is still battling around and trying to find solutions to. Uh, Neil, I think your earlier point about Michael Brown and uh, Breonna Taylor, what we saw, at least from where I'm sitting, is that there were pockets of protest against that, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and which had died down over a time without the kind of international spillover mm -hmm. uh, that George Floyd's death had. And I'm saying this because, you know, there was a fleeting reference to be sure on CNN, in fact, when uh, Ms. Taylor died uh, and people went on to the next news item um, with respect to George Floyd, however, I think what spurred the, the, you know, the international movement uh, for equality was the manner in which he was executed. Uh, and I think people quickly realized that uh, democracy is precious. I think South Africans have really began to uh, realize that democracy is precious. It needs to be protected. And at the same time, there was a need to really show solidarity with those in other parts of the world, including the United States, that continue to battle uh, a racial equality in a country that all of us as children grew up knowing as a country of opportunity and freedom.